Do I get a comment to that or, or to? I, I actually, I, I would like you to, first of all, I, I, um, I, I'd like you to first of all talk about how you think the tradition to capitalism, as you see it, would work from what we have right now. And then I'm gonna let you guys respond to each other's. Well, I think, the tra I think the trajectory towards capitalism is a hard one, much harder than I think the, the trajectory towards socialism, because I think the world, uh, in spite of all my efforts, the world is moving more towards socialism than it is towards capitalism. The general agreement is that socialism is a good, that coercion is good, that force is good, that forcing people to behave in a particular way that you want them to behave is right. I, I, the idea that force, coercion, Forcing somebody to do something they don't want is wrong, morally, and should never be exercised. That idea is not a popular idea. Um, I, I think the only way to move us towards capitalism is a, a, a real educational campaign challenging the philosophical foundation of the existing system that we have. The existing system, the existing system of thought that we have. The idea, the moral idea that your purpose in life is to live towards others. The moral idea that the collective is more important than the individual. The moral idea that the state is above all. That we see on the democratic side and on the republican side. That we see in politics across the entire spectrum. Those things have to be challenged. Until we're willing to challenge collectivism and moral altruism. Until we're willing to, to embrace a morality of individualism and a, and a political system of individualism, uh, a political system that elevates the freedom of the individual, that is built around freedom for the individual, I don't see how capitalism comes about. I think you see in the West movements to move towards a, a little bit more free, free markets. But then as soon as, as soon as they fix up things a little bit and the economy starts going again and people feel comfortable, they immediately bounce back to what socialism. You saw that with Reagan and the bounce back. You saw that with Thatcher and the bounce back. Because neither Reagan nor Thatcher challenge the fundamental beliefs that are required in order to build a capitalist society. And those are, are, are deeply rooted and they are philosophical and they require changes at the university level and changing in young people's thinking. And I see that move towards capitalism, towards my vision, as much harder, much more challenging. Uh, and much more educational than political. I don't like political, right? because politics is what? Politics is force. But think about how that eats at you, that this guy is lazy and he's going home early. This is exactly what happened on the kibbutz. And you work very hard, and you start resenting him, and you start hating him. Every time I see socialist, socialism, what you see is malevolent toward other people, resentment, hatred, because it creates Envy, rivalry, and hatred because it's a zero-sum world. I don't get paid for what I produce. I get paid what was negotiated, what was voted on, what people agree. Not based on my productivity. And somebody else might get paid exactly the same as I do, even though they're a lot less productive. That's what collective action does. And that's why unions are in decline. Unions are in decline because union members don't want to be in unions because it doesn't make any sense for them, particularly in the modern era, where they can negotiate salaries for themselves. Unions in decline because manufacturing jobs, you know, physical labor is in decline because of technology, because of robots, because of computers. And no software engineer, no software engineer, which, who is an employee, wants a union to represent them. You know, are, are they gonna be able to bounce around from company to company like they do in Silicon Valley, bidding themselves, they, they, their salary up every time they do it? No, not under socialism, you can't do any of that. So this conversation seems to be shaping up to be a lot about coercion. So I want to ask you both a question, respective to your, your preferred economic system about coercion. So I'll start with you, Yaron. Um, one thing that I hear is a critique of capitalism is that if you pit economic interests against each other, that there is an incentive for businesses to get government on their side and use that coercion <coughs> against their competition. And the question when we're talking about transitioning to a purely capitalist system from the mix that we have right now is do the really big companies already have the advantage yeah. that they could wield that power uh, against smaller businesses and against entrepreneurs in a way that there's no coming back from? So let me be clear, uh, you know, cronyism, which is what you're describing, is a feature of statism. It's a feature of systems like socialism. It's not a feature of capitalism. If you have a complete separation of state from economics, businesses don't lobby the state because the state has no power, no goodies to give them. It's only because the state has power, has resources, ha 
as favors to give businesses, do you get the lobby? Do you get the manipulation? Do you get the cronyism? And then it develops into protecting them from themselves from, from others. So if, if we talked about the transition, my first, if I were president, God forbid, um, <laughs> the first thing I would do is pass an anti-cronyism law. And it would be very simple. Zero subsidies, zero corporate taxes, which are stupid taxes. If you know anything about economics, corporations don't pay taxes. You pay the taxes. All taxes are consumption taxes, uh, all corporate taxes, consumption taxes or labor taxes. So employees and consumers pay all corporate taxes. So zero corporate taxes, so you can't give any loopholes and favors there. Zero uh, subsidies and dramatic reduction in regulation across the board. So every year, I would eliminate 25% of the regulations on the book, on the books. And once the state is separated from economic power, this lobby goes away. And I'll give you one quick story about this. In the early 1990s, the largest corporation in the world based on market capitalization was Microsoft. How much money did Microsoft spend in those years lobbying Washington? Well, the exact figure is zero. Largest company in the world did no cronyism, no lobby, no law firm, no building, nothing in DC. They had no presence in DC, nothing. And they came in front of Congress. Congress invited them in. Invited. Whenever Congress does, there's an invitation, right? There's a gun there saying, you better come. They came in and they sat in front of a Senate committee headed by a Republican, a young Alan Hatch from Utah. And Alan Hatch stood up and he yelled at them. And he said, you better be here in Washington, D.C. You have to build buildings here. You have to have higher lawyers. In other words, you have to love, you have to bribe me. Now, you can't say that in America, so you, you, you couch it in other terms. I mean, you can find this. This is all well documented. And Marcus Huck said, you know what? You leave us alone, we leave you alone. We're not interested. And they went home, and they continued to devote exactly zero dollars to lobbying. Six months later, several months later, knock on the door. We're here from the Justice Department. And you violated antitrust laws. And we're coming after you. You remember what the violation was? Anybody know what Microsoft did that is so evil that they had to be harassed for over 10 years by the Justice Department? Anybody know? They gave away something for free. A browser. I remember downloading Netscape for 70 bucks. You guys, you can, can you believe? You had to pay for a browser? You don't pay for anything. Everything's free in this economy. It's pretty amazing. And they gave it away for free. And that was an antitrust violation. And they had a, guess how much money Microsoft spends today on lobbying? Tens of millions of dollars. If you go downtown DC, about equal distance from the White House and Congress, they have a beautiful building. They've got massive numbers of lawyers. Because they realized that Washington won't leave them alone. So they better fight back. So you want to get rid of cronyism? Get rid of government intervention. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time, so I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourunbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...